All right, guys, welcome back to the SDSU podcast. This is episode 109. As always, I'm Andre Hackverdi, your host, and joined by my co host, Paul Garrison. What's going on, Paul? What's going on, Andre? Happy uh, Wednesday to you. Happy Wednesday. We're joined by uh, a special guest to start off the show, uh, Steve James. He is uh, um, has the, the Go Route YouTube channel covering Colorado Buffaloes football. Um, welcome, Steve. How's your night going, man? It's going great, man. Glad to be here. Yeah, tell us your obviously, um, you we see the Colorado Buffaloes logo in the background, and you know, there's a lot of integration between Colorado and San Diego State going on right now in the last week with, with the coaching staff. You know, just tell us a little bit about how you got involved with the go route and and uh, what you do there. Yeah, yeah, no worries, man. So I've been just trying to get into Colorado Buffalo football more. I've been a lifelong fan, um, been there for the low days and been there for the high days. Um, and right now it's just, you know, it's a bumpy road right now, ups and downs, but they're on the rise. And uh, right now I've just been enjoying it, uh, watching last season. Great start, not so great ending. But right now I'm just trying to go ahead and just do content on Car Buffaloes, um, you know, recruiting, a lot more recruiting as of late since the transfer portal opened up a couple of days ago. And then um, focusing on next season and spring game. So anything you want in Car Buffaloes football, go check out the, the go route on YouTube. Cool. Yeah, we mentioned, you know, last week we did a live stream. Sean Lewis was named the San Diego State new head coach to replace Brady Hoke. You know, he came from Colorado. He had a short time there, one year, but he was uh, Prime's Coach Prime's uh, offensive coordinator uh, for most of the year, at least. Uh, when he was hired as the offensive coordinator, you know, did you know who he was? What did you make of that hire um, as he was brought into the fold? Yeah, I mean, I thought the hire was smart. It, they were bringing a guy in who could, who knew how to run an offense, his offense, kind of like that up tempo offense, and I thought that would be great. Um, you know, I was on the impression that you know Shader is going to want to get the ball out of his hands fast, um, play his up tempo, try to outscore teams, which you kind of saw from Colorado in the first couple of games of the season last year. Um, it's just unfortunate when it got to the thick of the schedule on Pac-12 wise, um, things just got a little tougher to get that tempo going. Um, And that's just more or less uh, a personnel thing. Uh, There were a lot of holdovers from the last uh, players, last roster that they kind of kept on the roster. So because they kind of worked that often, the whole transfer portal recruiting came from the outside in. Uh, I think Coach Prime is realizing this year he needs to go inside more and get more big guys up front. Um, But Sean Lewis, you know, that guy, a lot of optimism. I uh, came with a great plan. Uh, personnel was great. Dylan Edwards shined in his offense, you know, that kind of that uh, bubble screen out to the side, get him open in space, get your most talented guy out there in space. So we can make the most out of his uh, yards, yards after the catch. So it's a great offense. I think it's going to do well in San Diego State. Where do you the, think? No, go ahead. No, no. I would. I, so, I mean, looking at it, I think one of the interesting kind of like debates, conversations nationally outside of, I think people who are following it like every day, like you are, um, was eventually Sean Lewis gets demoted, right? And he had the play yeah. calling duty gets taken away from him. Um, a lot's been made about the fact that their offense got worse after he was relieved of duty in terms of 12 points a game less. Um, and you know, the, obviously, you know, I think Washington state, the game against Washington state has to go down as maybe like the worst one of the season that happened shortly thereafter. Um, you know, what was the, why did he, if his offense, the offense didn't seem to be the problem. What was it about what Sean Lewis was doing that coach prime decided that he needed to make that change? You know what? I think it just was a, uh, more or less how the game was going as they were going through UCLA, Oregon, USC, and Colorado started mounting a lot of injuries on the offensive line. So we were putting in a lot of backups in. And Sean Lewis's system, which it does allow to, you know, get some guys out in space on bubble screens, and that does work. The problem is that once they knew that Colorado was not going to run and was only going to pass, they all the defenses did. All they did was they pinned their ears back and came rushing after Shooter or Sanders, and that's when he got injured pretty bad. So it's a question of of you know Shawn's offense does work, but as Pac-12 football went along and they started to get after Shador, 
they realized, that, and we couldn't run the ball. There was no way that offensive line could actually get any push and create any space for the running backs to get, any, to get into the gaps and actually get upfield. So Colorado became one-dimensional, and it really wasn't because of Sean Lewis or Bill O'Boyle, offensive line coach. It was just a matter of the personnel they had, injuries that came to the offensive side of the ball, and then what they could do. Once they became one-dimensional, it was a game over from there. It was just basically defense would just pin their back and went after Colorado and Shador. So how did Pat Shermer's offense differ than Sean Lewis's, given what you were just talking yeah. about? Yeah, you know what? It came down to just more of a balanced attack. And honestly, I think it came down to uh, Coach Prime was riding – uh, you know, his players pretty hard. You know, I need you guys to step up. I need you guys to block. I need you guys to do this. But the problem was there wasn't a, a skill level enough when the backups were playing to play to the level. And let's say they played in TCU game, the backups weren't able to meet that. Um, so it'd be it'd be more of a question of, you know, what could they do to start creating some options, something new, something fresh. And for what I know, from what you could tell, when you watch the game tape on TCU and you watch game tape, let's say on, USC or UCLA, you can kind of start to see where other teams were figuring out what Colorado was going to do and who were the playmakers were. And that limited it to what they could go to at that time on. So it's a combination of all that stuff plus injuries. And Pat Shermer had an offense where it was more balanced. And I think some of the offensive linemen that were there kind of bought into it more. And they were able to go ahead and you know get better push. Now they still lost those games. The games were tighter, but they still lost, again, that Washington State game. Uh, they were in it with Arizona. They were in it with uh, Oregon State, um, Utah State, you know, pretty much until until halftime they were in it. Um, so I think Pat Shermer, which, you know, he may actually take over as OC for the Buffaloes. It still lets me determine. Um, it just seemed to fit better with what Coach Prime was doing, and they seemed to have better protection as the end of the year. Do I think it was because of coaching? I don't think so. I think it was a matter of injuries and some of those guys were actually starting to come back towards the end of the year and they were able to get better push and better protection towards the end of the year. I think just, I think just a different voice kind of helped that moment in time. So. Well, that's interesting because statistically looking at it here, um, it didn't seem to be a, a whole bunch different. No, it was a very slight uptick, but it wasn't anything that was groundbreaking. Um, I think you just had a lot. Of, and I think also what I was kind of chiming to where Coach Prime was riding his players towards the midseason, wondering what was going on. What did all that, you know, that TCU game, Nebraska game, Colorado State game, where did all that protection go? Where did all that push go? I think you started to see him starting to not be so hard on his players and trying to say, hey, we can do it. We can get this going. And by doing that, I think some of the pressure – was starting to you know alleviate from some of the offensive linemen they were able to go ahead and play because i think towards the middle of the year you know things were hot things were very you know tensious in boulder where you know you come out to a hot star you start losing games coach prime doesn't understand what is going on here what is what's changed what are we doing differently that's when he started to think of other ways to get creative to infuse some type of confidence into his players and i think when he started to you know you know tell his players you can do this instead of just being so direct that allowed them to go ahead and to stay more competitive in games. But at that point on, Shadur was playing on, you know, it felt like one leg and no back, and he was just getting destroyed. Uh, so that point on, the season was over. And, you know, I'm pretty sure Sean Lewis, who came from Kent State, who was the head coach there, came to Colorado. I'm sure he had, you know, wishes and desires to get back into a head coaching job. And, you know, no better job than San Diego State. You know, that's a, that's a perfect fit for what he's trying to do, so. Yeah, we, I was going to say, you know, we didn't expect Sean Lewis to return at Colorado based on how things ended. But when you heard that he became the head coach at San Diego State, initially, did you say good hire, bad hire? Um, I think my brief knowledge of what San Diego State football has been in the past, I think it's a good hire. I think if he would have went to like a more like Penn State or maybe he went to – I don't know, maybe like a South Carolina. I think that just doesn't fit what he's trying to do. I think San Diego State's a perfect fit just by knowing what San Diego State has it in the past. Uh, I like Sean. Sean was a great guy. Him and Shadur got along great. Uh, Shadur and Pat get along great. I think it's a, just a question of some people didn't like the fact that everyone wants to point blame for somebody for why, what happened. 
You know, how did you go, you know, three and one, and then all of a sudden you start losing this game? Who's at fault? And sometimes it's it's a an accumulation of things. It's uh, you know, players get injuries, it's coaching, it's the voice, it's you know, your opponents. You know, Colorado's schedule was a gauntlet, you know, in the Pac-12, and they had to go through some hard team meal of schedule. And I think Coach Prime didn't realize what he needs. So I think Coach Prime is going to go more for a, you know, we need to be able to protect Shador. We need to go ahead and actually stop and run the ball and stop the run because that is where they got, you know, destroyed last year. And I think that is where he's going to kind of switch gears towards. But Sean Lewis, you know, his game plan was great. I just feel like it just kind of shifted gears to where Coach Prime wants to go in a different direction. He just kind of, you know, hit the eject button a little sooner they said instead of waiting for him to finish out the rest of the year, and then that's where we're at now. But I think Sean Lewis was always going to, you know, you know, look for a head coaching job no matter anywhere else. Uh, just looking to get more experience, and that's what Colorado was. So we can't. Uh, other question. No, no. I was going to say another question that I, that I had is that I find interesting about it is Sean Lewis is a run first coach. Like if you go to Kent State and you see like where he was, he never had a he never had a year where he didn't run the ball more than he passed the ball. Um, do you think that Coach Prime and seeing that you know that was where his son was playing, that was what they were good at, and eighty percent of their yards came through the air. And as you mentioned, they really had a difficult time running the ball, no matter how many attempts they they tried at it. Um, do you know if like where that where he shifted from being that run first? offense that he's always been great at to having to pass you know what i think it's a combination of what coach prime and what Shadur, you know wanted to accomplish what they wanted to do in 2023 season and then what kent state was going to do so i think they tried to hybrid them together but then over time they realized that you know i think coach prime wanted to shift to more and you know it's hard to say because right now the personnel last year because you saw like three of the offensive linemen that Colorado had last year last game all in all enter the portal so they're right. leaving because uh they know other guys are going to come in or they've been told that you know your job is starting job is not going to be here and then you may want to move on to something else um so I think you're going to see a whole different offense in Colorado I think it was just say hey we gave it a try you know we, we thought we could be this you know, high flying offense, you know, be TCU game, be the TCU team every game. But once they realize, once other teams figured out what they're doing and then injuries hit, they didn't have enough depth to sustain that type of offense. They had to start switching gears, but they didn't have any other way to go. And I think Sean Lewis's offense just kind of got lost in the shuffle. And then at that point, uh, once you start losing one, two, three, four, five games, then, you know, at that point on, you need to start making some decisions. And as a head coach, and he decided to go ahead and demote him from his play calling, thinking that would then cause a spark with the offense, which, it, like you said, a slight uptick, but it wasn't anything groundbreaking. It just was, you know, a way to stop the decline to go ahead and just steady the ship to end out the season. Because uh, at that point on, I don't think they knew that they were going to go to a bowl game. They were trying to stay in it with the Oregon State game, Arizona game. But beyond that, you know, you're pretty much just trying to, you know, just get some wins when you can and just make sure Shador, you know, is healthy going into 2024. So you mentioned offensive linemen. Obviously, you also mentioned Bill O'Boyle. He's he came with Sean to San Diego State. You know, Paul wrote an article on Monday basically uh, announcing that he was coming back or reporting that he was coming with Sean Lewis. And you know, we got a lot of Colorado fans that uh saw that and and commented and retweeted. A lot of joy, a lot of people happy uh, that Bill O'Boy left Colorado. Obviously, we we talked about how the running game never got going, how the offensive line struggled to protect Shadur. But how do you see it from that perspective, like how Bill O'Boy did, given the resources that he had, and uh, whether he, you know, is a is a good offensive line coach and is a good hire for San Diego State. You know, I, you know, pretty much him and, and uh, you know, Sean Lewis are pretty much a, a duo. They kind of go together from Kent State to Colorado, now to San Diego State. Uh, so that was expected. Um, I did see that as well. I did see a lot of CU fans and just people who follow Colorado to make a comment about that. You know, they're happy that he's gone and not in Colorado anymore. People just want someone to blame. People just want someone to say, hey, it's your fault. It's it's the coaching's the problem. And I'm like, if the coaching's a problem, then it wouldn't be such a roller coaster 
And, you know, he's a pretty quiet guy. He didn't talk a lot to the media. He didn't really, um, you know, command that type of presence. Um, I know when things were going, you know, a little rocky, you know, you didn't hear much from him, you know, at all. He was kind of quiet, but he didn't have to talk. You know, it's it's when you look at the 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 tape, when you look at the games you're playing, that UCLA game, UCLA game was just, it, it told everything. You saw players who were out of position, guys, they didn't know what to do with their hands, got to know what to do with their feet. And it wasn't a question of, hey, you know, the scheme isn't working. You've got players who are just not knowing what they're doing. And by doing that, they're out of place and you've got Shador just getting, you know, you know, jailbreak right at them. And you can coach guys all you want, but if guys don't know what to do, then it's a problem. And I don't know if you can fix that within a season. You can you can kind of band-aid it and kind of fix what you can and you know play here or situation here, scheme here, but you can't fix your personnel in a season. And people just want people just want to blame the coaches since they feel like blaming the players is bad. I'm just like, hey, you know, I, I know what this I know what the roster was before we went this season. I was surprised yeah. how did how well they played game one uh, when I watched the highlights. And I think it just was a combination of player, um, you know, development. And, you know, it's not on the coach. They were here for, you know, I think, I think they both got here in like if it was late December, early January. So literally it was less than a year to develop the staff, the, the roster that was here. So and then. I think they did the best with I did they did the best what they could with what they were dealt with. I think that's where it's at. And it just needs more time. Coach Prime and Cara needs more time to develop that obviously that 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 line and the D line and O line, because that is where they struggle the most. And that's where they got um, you know, they people picked them apart. And I applaud everyone in the Pac 12 for doing that because once they saw that, it was just game over and should have paid the price for it. EC Preps uh, said many of our high school coaches here in San Diego, I believe he's a good hire for the line at SDSU. So that's that's a good thing because they're going to look to try to recruit some linemen locally for sure. Yeah, and as I um, alluded to in the, art, in the article that I wrote on Monday, he's already been very active recruiting. And so I would uh, – um, EC Preps, tell me if I'm, if I'm correct. You are more of a pulse than I do. Um, but – the reason they believe he was a good hire is because they've been hearing from him already. They've already been, you know, keeping those relationships and renewing them, um, et cetera. Uh, another question I get very similarly related is, you know, we're talking about the lack of the run game um, and that maybe being the reason why Sean Lewis was um, demoted from calling plays. Um, but it's hard not to ask the question, Darian Hagan, who obviously is a, you know, there's been a couple of coaches like that um, at San Diego State who seem to go with every single coaching staff that gets hired. Demetrius Sumler, um, the cornerbacks coach, is kind of starting to approach that status. Um, but, you know, they obviously ran the ball better before Coach um, Sanders got there. He demotes Hagen to an ambassador role, takes him out of being the running backs coach. Um, obviously, the reason he's at San Diego State um, is because he wants to get back into coaching. He doesn't want to be an ambassador. He wants to actually, you know, recruit and do all of the things. Um, and mm -hmm. so I think, I think, you know, ask the, so the question is, um, was it a mistake? Was it a mistake to, you know, take away this guy who had been such a big part, especially considering the fact that the running backs underperformed? Yeah, and that's, that's, that's a great question. I think what we're seeing here as we go throughout this whole process is Coach Prime – kind of wants his guys um he brought a lot of guys over from jackson state he brought a lot of guys over from other parts of his coaching tree that he actually worked yeah. with uh darren hagan you know has a rich history with colorado you know he will be sorely missed he's a california guy um you know it's he's 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 survived hagan has survived a lot of regimes here in colorado and it's because of his wanting to take help anywhere he can and take on any role he can to help Colorado Buffaloes and the University of Colorado football. So I think this was a moment to where there was a guy coming in who was uh, flea, who he, uh, coach prime has been with him for a long time at HBCUs. And he went ahead and just kind of put him into the role of running backs coach. And that is where he is. He's the assistant uh, uh, coach to coach prime. Um, Darren Hagan just, I'm sure he could have been the ambassador if he wanted to be that, but he obviously has aspirations to coach again. 
and to do it in the city, the state that he grew up in is a perfect fit. Um, so I think he just realized that, hey, in this current, you know, coaching staff with Coach Prime and Coach Flea, they're pretty tight. You know, there's obviously there's not a way for myself to kind of, you know, wedge myself into something here. I need to go someplace else. Um, running back situation for Colorado, you know, it really was interesting to watch just when you thought a running back would have a hot hand he would get sit for somebody else and they just kept this constant rotation going in mm. um and I, it was more or less uh, a situation where you would see you know the hot hand which would be hankerson or wilkerson or edwards but it wasn't really they weren't really used to their best ability or they would, would just abandon the run and because it was they they try one run and get negative two yards, and they just start going to you know second along, third along, and then it's a punt. Um, so I think it was there was a lot going on there behind the scenes, I'm sure, about you know yeah. what play you're calling, you know, what how we get the office moving. And once I think I think once panic happened when they realized, you know, we're not competing anymore at a level we, we were in week one. Um, now you're just trying to figure out, you know, what can I do to start injecting some offense into my team. And then it became just, you know, trying whatever you can to hold the set, the set, the hold the ship up, uh, above water. And watching those games was hard because the teams you saw on week, week one, the teams you saw like in week seven, completely different teams. But then you had to just take it for what it was, you know, a lot of transfers, new personnel, new coaching staff. That's all you. That's all we. That's all as Colorado fans we could basically justify us with. It just, just a lot of change. It worked for a little bit. Now it's starting to show its, you know, its errors right now. And hoping that in year two, they can kind of gain better traction. I just think that, you know, Flea is, uh, you know, Flea's Coach Prime's guy. So. We have a question for you here from EC Preps. Is what I heard on the national news true that Dion wants to hire some of his NFL buddies like Warren Sapp? Full disclosure, Warren Sapp is one of my favorite players of all time. But <laughs> I don't know about uh, – defensive line coach at Colorado, but what what, do you, what have you heard? Yeah, I mean, there, there's been a lot of foreign players uh, that have come to Colorado, and one of them has been Warren Sapp. Um, he's been on campus uh, right before, I think in August. Um, he spent a lot of time with the D-line group, um, and, you know, he went ahead and said, you know, different, you know, meet outlets that he wants to coach, and he wants to coach at Colorado, and Coach Prime said, hey, you're more than welcome to come here as well and coach. Uh, so I think it's a mutual, you know, agreement to do it. If it happens, I don't know. It has it, it who, when it happens, I don't know either. Um, but if you were to come here, you know, that would be another gold jacket they would have on the defensive side to help them to develop some players. Does it help? You know, you'd hope because um, right now Colorado's in this situation where they're trying to, you know, kind of, 2.0 it kind of rebuilt some errors where they were lacking in 2023 2023 but it's going to be a slow burn it's going to be a slow slow build uh warren sap is just going to bring another you know hopefully set of eyes and ears to help you know build turn this scene around so i'd have to say the most popular name in san diego this week is probably danny o'neill <laughs> The uh, obviously he's a three-star quarterback from Indiana. Sean Lewis recruited him. He committed to Colorado in March. He decommitted a day before Sean Lewis was announced as the San Diego State coach. Um, he got an offer the night he was made coach, and he's coming on an official visit to San Diego State this weekend. What do you know about Danny O'Neill? And you know what? What should San Diego State fans, you know, when, be excited about in case he does commit and come to San Diego State? Yeah, I mean, no, make no, make no mistake about it. Uh, Daniel O'Neill is a is a Sean Lewis guy. I think I think Sean Lewis sold that to Deion Sanders, and I think that was um, a fit that he felt like was going to be great for his offense in Colorado after Shadur went to the draft, um, and that was going to be Sean's guy. Um, and I would imagine pretty much wherever Sean went, if it, if it was a one year deal at Colorado to go somewhere else, he was going to go follow him as well. He fits perfect with his offense. He fits perfect with what they're trying to do, get the ball out of his hands quick, you know, create some space. Um, I, I honestly, I, th I thought it was a smart move to, for Sean to put his imprint on Colorado football once Shooter left. But, you know, it, it makes, makes a lot of sense for him to follow Sean Lewis because, you know, that's who, who he wanted to be uh, his, his offensive coordinator. 
And um, you're going to find a couple, um, probably some Colorado players uh, that may follow uh, Sean Lewis to San Diego State and think about it. I think there's about nine uh, Colorado Buffaloes in the portal. So there's going to be some, um, you know, some transferring going on there. But I just feel like Dan O'Neill fits perfect in his offense. And it's going to be good for San Diego State to get that. Uh, it, it's we've, we've lost a couple commits at right as the season ended. Um, but you know, the transfer portals early and it's, and it's just started. So we'll see what happens. So. You got anything uh, for him, Paul, before we let him go? No, man. Thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us. Appreciate the insight. I think a lot of us had those questions about, you know, what happened at Colorado, um, Sean Lewis, when we asked about it, uh, at his press conference was very, very, you know, we were professional, we were polite, but, uh, you know, I, I definitely think you could see maybe some, uh, um, I think some values differences between them and just the way that they wanted to go about building the team, um, in terms of, you know, are you going to just treat college kids like they're free agents and you're just going to bring them in and bring the transfer portal, or are you going to build from the high school ranks and trying to do that route and trying to form relationships and all of those things. And I think um, ultimately, I think they disagreed on that approach. Um, and I think that's eventually what led to, to their, um, you know, divorce, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, you could definitely tell that I've watched press conference. You could definitely tell there was a philosophy difference in that. And you can kind of see how, um, you know, going to San Diego State, you know, he's going to do great there. You know, he's a great head coach at Kent State uh, with the Flashers, and he went ahead. He's going to be great at San Diego State. Uh, I, for one, you know, loved his offense, but it's good to see him go someplace and flourish, and, you know, no better place San Diego State. So, All right, man. Thanks a lot for joining. Uh, we'll do this again. Yeah, appreciate it, guys. All right, Paul. Uh, it was good to have Steve on and get some perspective on uh, some of uh, San Diego State's new coaches. Um, anything that stood out to you uh, from what Steve said? I don't want to get back to the Bill O'Boyle um, and just the way that it, the offensive line was described. Um, EC Preps made a comment about that. I asked him about just you know have the coach have the coaches in San Diego been hearing from. Um, uh, Coach O'Boyle, and they have, and and that's why they they've been hearing a lot from him. Um, and I, I think the biggest thing that that I took from that um, is it seemed like, as he said, with Bill O'Boyle, people were looking for a scapegoat. They were looking for a reason why um, why they um, they were, I think they were looking for a reason why to say that maybe this thing that started so great didn't end well. And, um, you know, I think it's too early to point fingers at Coach Prime. So I think they had to find somebody else to do it. Um, the flip side of it is, the flip side of it is they couldn't run the ball. They didn't get better at it. And, um, you know, obviously the coaches are going to obviously take a lot of blame for that. Yeah, I, it's I think it's probably more accurate to go to Kent State and look out how Sean Lewis and Bill O'Boyle and the rest of that staff did at Kent State and try to find parallels to what's going to happen at San Diego State as opposed to the one year at Colorado. Different conference, different uh, recruiting bases, different competition, and I think you can look at more of him as the head coach having a, a bigger imprint and having his assistant coaches have bigger roles as well. So um, I think that's a positive for San Diego State to look at um, – to look at both, obviously, both stops, but look at Kent State, the longevity of the five years at Kent State and, and stuff like that. We talked about um, O'Boyle. We talked about Hagen a little bit. Matt Johnson also came in um, mm -hmm. as the uh, quarterback's coach. He has history at Kent State as well. Um, I think we're still missing, um, what, a wide receivers coach and a tight ends coach. Um, so I think that's still yet to be announced. And then there's Ryan Lindley hanging, hanging out there uh, with a, a role that hasn't yet to be defined. I don't know whether it's going to be one of those two, whether it's going to be something else. Uh, how do you think the offensive staff has played out so far uh, based on what's been uh, reported and announced? There's a best-selling book um, that I think if you do any sort of like business or business management, you're like forced to read it um, from good to great. 
And um, in I, I would I would wager money that if we like panned around Andre's house, like we would see that book somewhere on the shelves. Um, it's it's just everywhere. This red book you see it in every office, everywhere from good to great. And one of the um, one of the things that that book talks about is the most important thing that any business and which is you know what John Lewis is doing right. Any team that you're going to be building. The most important thing you can possibly do is get the right people on the bus. And then after you get the right people on the bus, then you figure out where they should sit on that bus. And I think when looking at the people that um, he's hired, uh, when you look at what they've done, you look at their resume, you look at the different hats that they've worn, they, they have a lot of versatility. Um, they've been tight end coaches. They've been special teams and tight ends coaches. They've been assistant head coach, special teams, and tight ends. They've been wide receivers coaches. They've been, and so I think that versatility, I think will allow him to um, do exactly what good to great suggests, which is get the right people in and then see where everybody strengths in based off of who you're able to get, who, who, you know, you, you, you were able to grab. Like, I don't think anyone thought that, um, you know, coach Hagan was going to be somebody that was going to come in. So now you got this guy who's not part of, Sean Lewis's coaching tree is not part of that fraternity of guys who've worked really well together. So what does he do? Well, what does he bring to the table? And then how does that fit into all of that? And I think the biggest thing with all the guys from Kent state is how versatile they are as coaches, um, what hats that they've worn. And I think that that should serve them to do, you know, I think one of um, the question that you asked at the press conference, which was basically, how do you call the plays on offense? How are you the offensive coordinator and also the head coach? And I think part of that answer is there are these men that I've coached with that we have made mistakes, had successes, talked about it, figured it out. They support me. I support, I can trust them in all the installs and everything that they're going to do because they know exactly what I want. So I can focus on A, B, and C over here as being a head coach. Um, and so I think that versatility is is the thing that that has most stood out to me. What about you? Yeah, I mean, continuity, I think, is a big part of that, too. Uh, he's bringing guys in that he's worked with before um, and he's comfortable with and he's he knows he can be a cohesive unit with. He's just coming off a situation where he's even though he brought O'Boyle with him, he's coaching with a bunch of different guys. And for a head coach that he's never coached for. And I think you saw him having differences with the head coach, with the players. And I think now he understands, okay, back, going back to that cohesive unit of guys that he trusts, good guys that he believes in, guys that he communicates well with, is I think the biggest uh, bonus from who he's brought in. Now, you were probably the first person to mention the name Andrew Souter. Another mm -hmm. Kent State guy, his offensive coordinator there. But he is yet to come in into the fold, at least, you know. No, he is not. I've asked about him, and I haven't been able. No, it's always know. fun to be – it's hard to be able to, to figure that out and have – I'm sorry, I've asked you those questions, you know, like yeah. – go ahead. No, I, I don't know what's going to happen, whether there's going to be an offensive coordinator or if Sean Lewis is going to play that role and save that spot for another position coach. So – we don't necessarily know if Andrew Souter is coming over. Uh, we still mm -hmm. think it's likely because he did leave his coaching position at Minnesota. He took a, um, a um, I think, a coaching academy position or as a director of, of coaching um, somewhere on a national uh, coaching academy. Um, so it's not maybe he was out of coaching for good. It doesn't want to do any more coaching. and Or maybe they're just working out details to bring before they can make it official but it'll be interesting to see where that ends up absolutely and i think you know it's um you know we have a question here about the defensive coordinator and 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 no i i, I don't have any rumors about who that might be um you know it's it's um it's an interesting world this thing of rumors and where you hear things and stuff like that and trying to decipher all sorts of things um but i think this is another point to you know to on what the piggybacking on what Andre just said. Um, I don't know that his defenses have been successful where you would go and you would say, okay, I've had success, you know, and I would like to carry that over. Um, you know, the union tribune has reported that uh, uh, 
uh, Coach Maddox is not going to be retained. Um, and, you know, I think some of that makes sense because um, while I think Kurt Maddox would be able to be a great um, defense coordinator, I don't think there would be um, any personality problems or anything of that nature, just what I've understood from Coach. Um, I do understand that, you know, what has made San Diego State successful during the Brady Hill era was Kurt Maddox's defense. And, you know, you, you want to make sure that your 37-year-old head coach is in charge and that there are no other questions about that. Um, even if the uh, defensive coordinator is not trying to make that be about it, um, everybody will just be, um, you know, asking that question if you were still on staff. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see how that works out. But as far as right now, no, there hasn't even been, um, you know, they're not even really telling the recruits. The recruits are unsure of, of what um, even the system is going to be. Um, and I think it would behoove them to uh, move in a direction because they got a lot of, uh, they have an important weekend coming up with the guys who are going to be coming into, um, who are coming into town for their official visits and being able to have some of these answers, I think, you know, would, would really help them. It is eerie how quiet it is regarding that defensive coordinator um, hiring right now. Like nobody knows anything. Um Definitely not the people we talk to. And as you said, none of the recruits that are coming in. Like it's I don't I I I don't know if he had guys in mind when he was interviewing for the position and maybe those guys found other spots somewhere. Uh and he's now looking to, you know, his uh, off another list or something. I don't know. But I think it would be prudent to get a defensive coordinator in place because there's probably some defensive players who have yet to enter the portal or are thinking about the portal, but would rather find out first how the defense is going to look and where they fit in. But, you know, some people might get impatient um, and want to enter the portal and start talking to other teams. So I don't, I think it would be, um, I think we'll hear hopefully soon now that we're in the midst of the transfer portal and we have early signing day two weeks. And as you said, this weekend is, I think they've got eight guys coming in uh, for official visits for the class of 2024, six of them have already verbally committed. Um, obviously, they're still committed with the new coaching staff in order to come in for an official visit, and most of them have said they are. And then there's two guys. We mentioned Danny O'Neill. Uh, there's also Isaiah Buxton, a local guy from Modern Day Catholic. So those two guys are going to be on that official visit with six guys that have said yes, and uh, we'll see what kind of impact those six can have on those two. Uh, but there's defensive guys there. Isaiah Buxton is one of them, right? Like he want he coach Sumler is his DB coach or is at least a cornerback coach. He's recruiting him, but he wants to know what defense they're going to run. He wants to know uh, where he's going to fit into that. And and until you have a defensive coordinator, you have more answers there. It's going to be hard to answer those questions this weekend. Yeah, I, I think it's great. Um, you know, I think to answer um, EC Prep's question, which is a good one, how many potential um, – recruits uh, are going to be early, meaning they're going to be enrolling early at San Diego State. You know, this is a big shift, I think, that took place under Brady Hoke compared to um, what um, Rocky Long wanted to do. Rocky Long always said that, you know, your second semester in high school was like the best time of his life. And why would he want to take that away from from these young players? Um, and, you know, Brady Hoke was the opposite. And Brady Hoke said, you know, like, we need to get you in. We need to get you acclimated. Um, and so I, I think potentially um, the, the vast majority of the high school guys who are coming in um, are going to um, be able to, to uh, come in early and we'll, we'll get that exact number as we see. Um, but, you know, um, Andre mentioned Isaiah Buxton um, and Danny O'Neill, both of those guys at other places were intent to come in early. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we obviously we had on our podcast um, a couple episodes ago, Anthony McMillan uh, running back, um, Isaiah Buxton's teammate. He's coming in early. Um, and so we've heard from others as well. Um, but the full conversation, I think, on, on recruiting will probably maybe be a live episode when everybody signs and and all those kinds of things. Um, I think we're trying to stick yeah. with the stick with the stick with the coaches. Yeah, just uh, just quick thing. Look at Marcus Ratcliffe. He came early and started mm -hmm. week one as a true freshman. Uh, you had Zyrus Fiaseu, who didn't start as a freshman, but when uh, Michael Shawcroft got injured, 
Guess who started, came in and started the rest of the season in 2022 as a redshirt freshman? And I think he got the leg up on juniors and seniors because he mm-hmm. was there early. Mm-hmm. So I think it's definitely shown to be a, a boost for sure. Well, especially too, especially too, like um, with, especially too with the um, fact that they're going to be installing a new system and these freshmen get to come in and they get to be basically the only time a freshman is going to come in and be on the same ground as like the returning players, at least with, you know, installing the system. So I, I think it's a, if they were able to do it, man, I think it's, it's really going to benefit them. Um, you know, even if they don't, even if they end up redshirting, just the fact that now you're entering your second spring after your redshirt season. And it, I think it really like piles up the knowledge and snaps that you get. Fernando Arellano asks, would bringing in Danny Gonzalez make sense? What do you think? Yes. Yes, absolutely. I, I think, I think bringing in Danny Gonzalez absolutely helps. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, he, he is a guy who is about the right things. Um, I think he's another guy that you can bring in there who's had head coaching experience. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of those Bill Boyles we talked about um, in, in the article introducing him at Shadron State. He, um, you know, had he was the Division II coach, national coach of the year. Uh, I think it's 2007. Um, but Danny Gonzalez, yeah, I think I think, you know, being able to, to see not only somebody who um, gets what it is to be a, a head coach, but also somebody who knows what it is to be the defensive coordinator at San Diego State. Um, obviously has, has, you know, deep recruiting ties, having done that at, at Arizona state and San Diego state. So I, th- I think that it makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, but it, going back to the, the question about, you know, Kurt Maddox, you know, you, you'd be wondering like, if you're going to bring in a three, three, five guy, like you had a really, really good one in house. Like, I'm, yeah. I mean, just, you know, we, we interview a lot of coaches and, um, you know, there's one like our favorite person to talk ball with is absolutely Kurt Maddox. And, um, you know, it, the, the, I think coach Hoke described him as like, there's nobody who works harder. And, and I can, I, I can completely believe that and, um, incredibly sharp, sharp defensive mind. And so I think if you're going to stick with a three, three, five, I think it's an interesting, it would be an interesting thing to take somebody outside of the guy who one, you're already paying and two, um, you know, is really good. Um, yeah. and, and so I, I think it would be really interesting to see it, but it does, that doesn't mean Danny Gonzalez isn't, isn't a good hire. It just means that, um, it just, it's just, it just would be an interesting question to ask. Like why, why was, why is this three, three, five better than this three, three, five? Yeah. The, a related question that I see a lot and it's a really good question is if you move to a, away from the three, three, five, let's say you bring in a guy who plays a four, three, or a three, four. Um, do you have to completely gut the defensive roster and bring in guys for that defense? Or can people shift? Football players are football players. And can mm-hmm. people shift to new roles and still be able to be successful right away? I think that's a great question, as you just said, is going to be. Um, and, you know, I think the question ultimately has to do with your um, the, the size of defensive linemen you believe you can get. Um, if, if I am looking, if I am um, Sean Lewis and I am looking at San Diego State and I'm saying, okay, what has San Diego State done well? What have they not done well? Um, and I would say that they could not stop the run this year. Um, you want to talk about teams in the Pac-12 going to Colorado and just running it down their throats and saying, stop us. We know you won't. We're going to do time of possession. We'll keep your offense on the side and we'll win. Um, that was the exact same tactic for against San Diego state that all the mountain West teams did once, you know, uh, Boise state uh, proved that San Diego state could not tackle for anything, you know? Um, and so I think that if I'm, if I'm asking that, I'm saying, why is the three, three, five, not stopping the run. And, you know, if you remember Andre um, a few years ago, we had uh, Saguna Luby um, on his on the podcast um, right when we started, and he was you know going through his draft evaluation, which uh, by the way I nailed just for the record. Probably got ten wrong, but I got that one right because um, he's just an, he's an athletic freak, athletic freak. But he's he's been doing things in the NFL, right? He just uh, you know there's a block punt that he was able to get, and um, he had an interception that that he went through um, that he got, and so he's he's been playing well. But we asked him about the defense in 2021, which was the last time that they dominated up front. 
And he basically said, we ran basically a 4-2 the whole year. I was sitting in a 4-2. Um, you put Cameron Thomas up on the line. Obviously, he was on the line. I'm sorry, you put um, Katie McDonald up on the line. He basically became your fourth rusher. Um, and, you know, you had Keyshawn Banks and Jonah Tavai inside. And it was basically a 4-2. And they just lined up and they said, beat us because you know exactly what we're going to do because we're that talented. And they have NFL players throughout that entire roster um, Trenton Thompson would be another one who was on that team who's who's you know making his mark now in the NFL and um, I think that would be the biggest question is do they have to have you know Jonah Tavai, Keyshawn Banks, Cameron Thomas all at the same time to make that defense work again and if the answer is yes you can't keep playing it um, because San Diego State is likely not to be able to get three linemen that like that every year that you can count on and you're going to make it your system right because if there was four down linemen like those guys would have excelled in that defense too. Um, and so I, I think that's the question is, you know, it's always been, you get the three, three, five primarily because you cannot get the upper echelon defensive line. And um, you know, if, if, if Sean Lewis has a different idea about that or the person that they bring in and they're able to get some of those space eating, some of those, you know, actual defensive tackles um, because the truth is most of the guys on the roster are defensive ends in most defenses. And so it's like, if they want to, you know, go to that, I, I could completely understand it from the perspective of they got to stop the run and they got to figure that out. Um, I don't think it ma- it will matter a whole bunch to, um, I don't think it'll matter a whole bunch to uh, the safeties. I don't think it'll matter a whole bunch to the corners. I think uh, what you end up probably doing is your Aztec becomes a weak side linebacker your Sam linebacker puts his hand on the ground and you just become a little bit more predictable, a little less the opportunity to, to, to do smoke and mirrors and shift your coverages and things like that and try to do confusion. Um, but at the same time, you also potentially um, could pl- allow your guys to play quicker because you're not doing as many complicated things on the defensive side. Well, one of the things other than stopping the run and up front is, getting beaten in the slot was, has been a big problem and having a warrior safety play in the slot, as opposed to maybe a nickel corner or, Mm. um, you know, that, that could be a shift in the defense that a new coach could look at and say, okay, we were getting beaten in the slot, but now we're going to switch it up. Instead of we're going to play a a corner at nickel who's better man to man coverage. Um, so those, I think that that's a consideration as well. Um, People can play. I mean, Warrior, they've shifted corners to Warrior safety, Warrior safety to corner throughout, you know, even Rocky Long and Kirk Maddox. So it's not like they haven't done that. And I think the goal was always to put the five best guys in the secondary on the field. And I don't think that changes. But if you can do a better job covering the slot, I think that's going to give your defense a a, a boost. What do you think about – the two guys that are returning on the defensive side, coach, it's uh, Demetrius Sumler and Boje Billy Moiatu. Uh, what do you think about the decisions to retain those guys? Well, um, I mean, let's start with Demetrius Sumler. I think the the moment it was like, hey, there's going to be a new staff. Brady Hoke is retiring. Um, I think he was a unanimous person that that everyone said this guy needs to come back. He does a great job. Um, you know, I, I, I'm always amazed with coach Sumler, um, because, uh, he's never given San Diego as his like recruiting area. And yet he's recruiting all the San Diego guys. Um, and, and so that's the, um, you know, the little, little sneak preview to, to the next episode that's coming up. Um, we just interviewed Tayton Bayer, who's a cornerback from Centennial high school, um, and a big part of the reason why he's going to stay committed to San Diego state, a really good corner, super exciting player for the 15th best team in the nation, um, at a high school. And he was the man at, at, for his defense in that secondary. Um, and, but the reason he's staying committed is because of, uh, coach Sumler staying there. Um, and then I, you know, I think you start looking around and coach BoJ, um, coach BoJ feeling me out to, Ooh, um, I think that you, uh, you he played oh, for a this, cathedral. I was I'm familiar, but tell us, let's go. Absolutely right. Yes. Yeah, yes. He, yes. So he was at Cathedral and he actually he played at Colorado. 
So keeping the Colorado theme of this episode, he played at Colorado as a running back there, um, put up good numbers. Uh, but yeah, he was dominant in high school uh, here in San Diego. Um, and I think that helps him, gives him like when he's going into these high schools in San Diego, like if they don't, if these kids don't know who he is, they'll, they'll find out quickly. Um, and there's no better person recruiting San Diego and trying to keep local guys, hometown heroes than Demetrius Sumler. Yeah. Um, but then coach Boje, you know, I think the, it's been a real challenging idea just because, um, you know, we don't know him. Obviously we've interviewed him. Um, we've had him on the podcast, we've written articles on him. So we've gotten to know him that way. Um, we, we, we talked about one of the main keys that Sean Lewis needs to do is he needs to be able to keep um, that, that Polynesian flavor that has been part of San Diego state. Um, and so we, you know, we, he obviously checks that box, which is great. Um, and um, talking with, you know, different sources, um, they love coach Boje. Um, if, if there was a, you know, if, if Sean Lewis, which he, you know, I don't know. I mean, listen, Boise state fired their coach because their star player went into the transfer portal and then came back. And now he's going to play for the guy that they hired. So, um, you know, players have a lot of leeway in, or have a lot of say now in, in what happens in staffs. Um, so maybe this isn't going to be a bad idea, but if you pulled, I think players from a position coach, or if you wouldn't said, Hey, who's somebody who really is impactful for you um, and, and you would want to make sure you stay. I think a lot of people would say Boj, And, um, and so it's just, it was not a name that we had said, Oh, this is a guy you need to st- keep because he wasn't rooted in the former staff or in the history of San Diego state. But um, as there was rumors and ideas that maybe he wasn't going to be retained and coach Slumler was going to be the only guy and then it started pivoting like, no, it looks like it's also, I think, I think it's going to turn out to be really, really a smart move. Um, and, you know, there's already, um, uh, he's already made an impact in um, local recruiting um, that, that San Diego state has been able to, to, to at least get some interest from some local guys um, because of the work that he's done. So I thought th- those, those made a lot of sense. Um, and I think coach Lindley makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, you talk about, local cachet being able to walk into any place in San Diego with any team. Um, and Ryan Lindley is somebody that matters and why Ryan Lindley is somebody that, that people pay attention to. Um, and so I, I think that, uh, I think that that's a, a really, really good hire as well. Um, and you know, his, his, uh, his position is unknown going back to that whole analogy of getting the right people on the bus and I just want to remind you that, uh, and you, you correct me, give me the right thing. I'm pretty sure um, he worked with linebackers at Mississippi State when he was a defensive analyst. And I don't, I don't remember. I don't know. Okay, but he was definitely a defensive analyst, right? That was that yeah. was that was a for sure. Um, and so, I mean, there's there's so many different parts to that because. You know, when we had um, Coach Lindley on the podcast before he got hired, he was still working at Mississippi State Um, because that's what you do. You go find out what Ryan Lindley is doing. If you're covering San Diego State sports, it's like, what's Ryan Lindley up to? Because everybody wants to know about Ryan Lindley. That's the kind of cachet he has. And so as he's a defensive analyst at Mississippi State, we interviewed him. He was great with his time. Um, But, you know, he's telling us about Mike Leach pulling him to the side and still talking offense with him and keeping him abreast with that. And so you could see that's a fast paced offense. You could see maybe some similarities of why Sean Lewis would want to get that Mike Leach coaching tree kind of flavor into what he's the recipe and the things that he's building here. Um, but it also wouldn't be shocking to me to see Ryan Lindley move back to the other side of the ball. Um, and again, going back to that versatility that clearly Sean Lewis like appreciates, you know, he, that might be his way of being able to continue to be um, a recruiter and stuff. And um, along with all the other guys that we've been naming um, coach Lindley is a guy who's out in the community and keeping connections. And um, you know, he's, he's, he's a reason why, again, there's guys that are visiting this week, um, this weekend. And it's because of the work that he's doing. I do want to add something on BoJ. Like, yeah. there's the notion that the defensive line was not good this year. 
and I, I don't disagree with that notion, but that there, why would the defensive line coach then keep his job, right? But mm-hmm. remember, Boje got here this year after right. Justin Enna took a job at BYU. So these weren't his guys that he recruited, that he had developed, right? Obviously, he had developed guys during the season. But you also got to factor in Brady Hoke's role as a defensive line coach. Like the practices we went to, it was a Brady hoax show for the defense alignment. And um, Boje obviously was a defense line coach, and he was part of that. But you, you know that it was Brady hoax show. And I think you can kind of look at it now that now it's going to be Boje being the main defense line coach. He's going to have his opportunity to recruit and bring his guys in, either in the transfer portal or in the high school class, right? And so I think – um, that makes sense to me, keeping that continuity, given the fact that he wasn't there three, four, five years, uh, just like the other some of the other coaches were. Um, and, you know, the Polynesian aspect of it, I think, is, is key as well, because you definitely want to keep that pipeline open and that uh, recruiting uh, benefit because they have had a ton of success uh, in, the, in that in that regard. And you don't want to uh, lose that, you know, overnight anyway. No, I agree. And the only other thing that I would add is, you know, I know that we live in a knee jerk world and we live in a, if the moment you do something bad, it's like, you got to go. But I don't think that that's very smart, especially for group of five teams. Um, You know, one of the questions that we have been, we asked after the 2021 team was, can you, can you replace this many all Americans? Can you do that? And the answer turned out to be no. But I don't think that should be surprising. And I think when you look at the defensive line, I think you start looking at the strides Ryan Henderson made. I think you look at Brady Nasser. I think you look at, you know, Darren Dalton obviously got hurt, but he obviously, you know, was somebody they were going to be counting on. Um, and and so I think you start looking at some of those younger guys and you started to see them progress. Um, and then, you know, I think you're going to look back at what they did at UNLV um, and the fact that, you know, he left and UNLV couldn't, have a good defensive line after that, you know, and I think that speaks um, volumes as well. So I wonder if fan Garrison here is, is related to me or Max Garrison on the team. I, it, I'm not sure which one um, to me. Uh, I think this is actually, uh, don't let this get to your head. I think it's a really good point. Um, and I think this is a, this is a different philosophical approach than um, what Brady Hoke and his staff did. I think Brady Hoke and his staff did not do that last part, which was build your defense around your personnel until I think think they had that part. I think they wanted to build their offense and their defense every year um, with, with certain ideas, but build it around the players that they had. And I always thought that that was a really, really big challenge that you have to be able to recognize like what you're really good at, start from scratch almost, build it up again and actually be at an elite level. Um, And so I do think that, you know, one of the differences that we're going to see is Sean Lewis is going to do what uh, Fan Garrison talks about, which is there is a system that they're going to want to put in place. We'll see what that is for the defense. And they are going to try to build players who can fit that. Um, And I think, you know, uh, that marriage between being people centered and system centered you know, is the, is the conflict and the conversation that they're having. But I think coach Lewis was, was pretty, was pretty um, clear on what he's trying to do. Robbie says, I would think coach Lewis would be a pro at that coming from Kent state. Yeah. Excellent point for sure. Mm-hmm. 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 Wow. Let's go to special teams. Yeah. Zach Barton. Um, Zach Barton was a special teams analyst at Kansas last year. Right. But he was the special teams coach under Lewis at Kent State for, I think, his entire uh, tenure there. So it's not like he was promoted from analyst to coordinator without a coordinator experience. I think the most fascinating thing about this was that he was also named the associate head coach. Right. Which I think surprises me, surprises some people. Um, What do you think about this hire? Well, I mean, I'm not surprised in the sense that he was also the associate head coach at Kent State. So Mm -hmm. it makes sense that 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 would happen. Um, I am really curious when we get the opportunity to interview him or or Coach Lewis again. um, I'd love to be able to ask the question that question. um, But framing it this way, 
you know, the associate head coach for the Aztecs um, prior to, to this season was their, their running backs coach, um, coach Horton. And um, you know, it, when you go to a practice, um, which, you know, everyone has um, the specialists aren't really doing so, stuff until it's like their turn. And so I'm really curious to see um, how much more active um, coach Barton is than coach Deacon coach Deacon. Uh, we had him on here multiple times. Um, I think, you know, uh, somebody who knows their P's and Q's. And, and if there's somebody that you're expecting to like be a head coach in five years, um, it's Doug Deacon. And, and so I think that, you know, he's going to come out looking, he's going to come out just fine with, with whatever it is that he's going to go do next. Um, but uh, because of what his position was, you know, he would definitely do other things on the, on the team while they were practicing other positions and things of that nature. But I'm just yeah. curious to see if, you know, it, because it's your special teams guy um, who was able to maybe be a little bit of that quality control that a head coach brings to a practice um, going between the offense and going to the defense. I mean, you have to assume that Sean Lewis is going to spend more of his time with the offense and, and yeah. putting things in and installing. Um, and so this allows a second pair of eyes when your associate head coach can also go and look at your defense can, you know, and it's, and it's been a voice um, that's that, that he knows um, the flip side of it is uh, he's got really big shoes to fill. Um, you know, it's, it's really an interesting dynamic. I think when you look at um, when you look at San Diego state, uh Sean Lewis coming in as the offensive coordinator, everybody is speaking, everyone's speaking about, um, everyone's speaking about, you know, how it's going to be so much greater. He's an innovator. Um, the defense, they don't know yet, but, you know, people are just kind of still stuck on that. But no one's talking about the special teams in the long run of success that San Diego State has had um, under Doug Deacon. And, um, you know, they, they, they've won a lot of games and deep and special teams has played a huge role. And, and he's obviously had success at Kent state with the players that he had there um, definitely has a track record of success. Um, but I think of all of the the spots, you could make the argument that this is the the one that could be hardest to fill um, for the new coaching staff. But, you know, uh, again, uh, as, as Steve alluded to earlier um, with coach Sanders, bringing in his guys, um, He's doing the same thing. And sometimes that works out fantastically. And the guys are able to kind of go to that next level and be just as skillful as coaches. And other times people jump to that next level and they're not up for the job. And so it'll, it'll be interesting to see how those things work out. Um, but again, he's another one of those hires that, that seems to, to fit, um, you know, when you're reading the tea leaves ahead of times, like, okay, here's a guy that has a lot of experience with Sean Lewis and um, you know, I think it, it's it's smart for him to get as many of those guys as possible. To add on to your comment about maybe maybe helping out on the defensive side, he was a co-defensive coordinator and a defensive line coach at Winona State for six years, so he does have experience on that side of the ball. Um, and he's a, he was a recruiting coordinator too, so like he mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would be good at that. I, yeah, to echo your comments about Deke. Definitely, I think he, he San Diego State and San Diego will miss him. Um, I don't think he'll have a problem finding a job um, pretty soon as a special teams coordinator anywhere in the country, or if he wants to move to professional ranks. I think he's a he's a guy that's a head coach in the making for sure, um, and that we wish him well and look forward to seeing where he ends up. Uh, the last guy on this list we want to talk about is Jeff Sobel. Uh, Most important person on this list. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> he's the guy that's going to basically start the year off, right, with the, the, the conditioning program that starts in January. Um, he's, he's the head of football performance, which is kind of the modern age name for the strength and conditioning coach. Uh, Robbie uh, puts here, reading comments online, the players at Akron really loved him. In my mind, he's going to be one of the most important pieces. Definitely echoes uh, what Paul just said, uh, for sure. What, do you th what have you learned about him? Uh, and, um, you know, what could he bring to the staff uh, and the, the this football performance program 
that may or may not have been lacking at San Diego State. Yeah, I, I you know, I think that uh, I think that to when Rocky Long was the head coach and then they moved to Brady Hoke, the idea was continuity. And so it made sense to um, keep that continuity with Adam Hall and keep moving forward. Um, but, you know, it, it, this hire was clearly about cha- a culture change. And um, the the head coach is the one who gets all the headlines. The head coach is the one who, um, you know, obviously does the X's and O's, sets up the practices and all, does all of those things. But the most important hire is your strength and conditioning coach. It's the person who is going to be running your program when all of the stuff that you don't see on the field is actually going to be determined whether it's going to be successful, I should say, because what they were doing where no one was watching. Um, the culture, the, the, the person who, you know, um, I, I would wager that any person, I'm going back to Robbie's comment, any um, – strength and conditioning coach who had any longevity at any place is absolutely going to be loved by those players because he is their most day-to-day contact. They have more contact with the strength and conditioning coach than they do with the head coach. I mean, that's the person who, who is there with them the most. And if you don't fall, if you don't fall into their system and their plans, you leave because you're there with them every day. And if you stay, it's because it, they resonate with you and and you buy in. And so, you know, um, I think they're going to be doing a lot of things that are tempo. Um, you know, Adam Hall, I think, um, you know, I think like um, Coach Deacon, if he's not going to stay at San Diego State, I think has the ability to, to go and do a lot of things. Um, I think he was great at his job. I think that, uh, you know, San Diego State and, the, and, the, and the, their ability to do what they did started with him. Um, but, you know. Even I remember asking um, Coach Hoke about him and, you know, he kind of have jokingly was like basically hinting like, let's not talk about Adam Adam Hall because the University of Texas may want to come in here and get him because he's from that area and da da da. He's that good. He's that good that that he would belong at some level at the highest places in in the sport. Um, You know, Adam is a guy who loves his job, who, you know, we've obviously every year we would start um, our series of like the next season. We would start with the strength and conditioning coach because we knew how important it was. And coach Hall was always great with his time, always gave us insight. Um, But, you know, if you're trying to change the culture to that Aztec fast and you're trying to do all of that, um, you have to go out and and get a new strength and conditioning coach. And, um, you know, the the proof is going to be in the pudding. I mean, that's just it. Um, they, they, you know, going back to our conversation with Steve, um, part of the fact that Colorado as the season went on, wasn't as good, um, could also be an indictment on their strength and conditioning program. Like those things show, those things show up in the season as time goes on, you know, and the fact that San Diego state, had every reason to quit last year and did not quit except for, I would argue, you know, a little part of the, of the third quarter against air force, but then have the wherewithal to catch themselves and like amp it up again, um, which I think is pretty special is because of Adam Hall. That's the reason that San Diego state never quit. And, and um, even if, you know, when they weren't good, they weren't finding success, they weren't doing those things. And then obviously we're able to win the old oil can. Um, a lot of that has to do with the culture that, that Adam Hall laid in. So, Again, um, you know, big shoes to fill because I do not think, um, you know, there are obvious issues when you finish four and eight. Um, I do not think strength and conditioning was one of them. Um, It is the right thing, like I said, to replace them. But again, it's another place, really, really big shoes to fill. Yeah, if you want to play 80 to 90 snaps a game on offense and you're running to the line of scrimmage and trying to snap it within 10 seconds of the play clock starting, like you're gonna need obviously your quarterbacks, your receivers, your running backs are probably gonna be in great shape, but your offensive linemen who are bigger, huskier guys who are more concerned with adding bulk and weight and strength and not maybe not um like cardio or maybe not um you know agility or things like that. I think that's gonna be the biggest shift uh with the new offense that's coming in. And that's where I think it does help to have a change at that position with a guy coming in that's used to that, 
right? Adam Hall, I'm sure Adam Hall could be able to figure out what was needed, but you're bringing in a guy who's done it for several years under this offense um, and um, would be able to kind of, uh, you know, hit the ground running per se, rather than trying to figure it out on the fly. But I, I do believe Adam Hall is going to, is still within the program. I think he's being reassigned. Uh, but as you said, if he wanted to get a, get a strength and conditioning coach position somewhere else, I'm sure he would, there'd be people lining up uh, to try to hire him. Anything else uh, we want to talk about before we close it out here, Paul? Uh, only the most interesting hire of the entire thing. Really? We're going to skip him. Who would that be? I mean, we talked about it a little bit. All right. So I'm not, this, this is, this is my perception. This is my perception. Uh, Deion Sanders comes in and he basically, he basically says, listen, everything that's been happening in Colorado is bad. We have to uproot everything, including the running backs coach, the legacy guy, the guy who's given everything. We're going to make him an ambassador. We're going to take him out of the coaching ranks. I'm going to bring my guy in. Um, and then there is this, you know, Sean Lewis was the most high profile hire. Um, how do you get, you know, wow, wow. Deion Sanders got a sitting head coach to leave his head coaching position to come and take a job. Right. Um, and then their offense is dynamite. They're unbelievable. They're outscoring everybody. They're, 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 they're the talk of the world. And then there's this divorce that takes place. Um, and you know, uh, people had had different ideas. I wasn't there. Can't really say you just can rehash what people said, but there were some groups that said that essentially inside of the locker room, um, people were gravitating to Sean Lewis's leadership and it was too competitive with Deion Sanders. And so he demoted him to keep his, you know, because you can't have two captains of a ship. Um, and if there is this, this narrative of that, these guys just didn't see eye to eye, um, and then Sean Lewis goes and hires the like actual deep rooted Colorado guy has him leave Sanders, staff and brings him over to San Diego state. Um, I think it, it just paints the story that Darren Hagan in that feud was siding with Sean Lewis and that he was the guy who was doing it the right way for the kids in the right manner. Um, he was doing it the Colorado way. If, if you, yeah. if you get my drift. And I think that that was absolutely communicated by that, that hiring. Um, and, you know, uh, if you are as competitive as it seems like Sean Lewis did, I think he got the last laugh with that hire. I think he, he, you leave that and you take, you take Colorado, you know, and it's like, okay, you're divorcing yourself from the history of Colorado. That's fine. Do that. But then you bring him down here and then taking that away. I think um, he reminds me of the running back coach that they got last year before he went and took the uh, job with the Rams, you know, an older guy, a guy who's been around, um, but I love getting it. Thank you. I love getting the, a guy from Los Angeles. I love getting an older guy in the room. Um, I love, uh, and th this was, this was a question. Um, I, I, you know, I think Ryan Lindley is phenomenal. I think Ryan Lindley is, I think he's going to be a great coach. I do see him one day being a head coach, but I'm not sure at this. <laughs> yes, that's the point. That's, that's exactly the point. That's exactly the point. He, he was the guy who, who, who the kids wanted to live with. It's exactly right. Um, and, um, <laughs> and, but I, I'm not sure that Ryan Lindley at this tenure of his career, especially with getting demoted and all those things, whatever's going to happen is necessarily going to be enough of a counterweight to all of the guys who have worked together to be able to offer enough of a different voice to maybe add something to what Sean Lewis is doing. Right. Cause you can't, as, as, as Steve said, people start to figure him out a little bit and you want to be able to keep being innovated. You want to do this. So, um, Hagen is going to bring it, be able to bring a different voice. Um, and, and, and so I think that's really positive. I think when they get into the meetings and it's not just, let's do what we're comfortable with, let's, but let's try to see things from different perspectives. Um, you mean, you want to talk about 
guys who have, I was listening to Andrew um, Souter, dude, craziest thing. He has an hour long podcast. Everybody should listen to it. It's an old one. Um, there was like a fire on a side road and I was just stuck for an hour, but I listened to the entire podcast. It was great. Um, but he talked about uh, Bill O'Boyle and on that podcast. And he just said like that every single time we like, we go on the board and we like create this new innovative run. He ran it 20 years ago and we didn't have any idea about it. I mean, everything you implement Bill O'Boyle knows about. Well, I think the same thing, same thing is true for Hagen. And as, you know, they're trying to do this up-tempo, shifting, lots of formations, I mean, you have these guys who have this great experience who, who they can depend on. And I think it was an absolute home run hire, um, especially, um, you know, working with, with, with the, the stable of running backs that are there um, who are going to be absolutely the most important skill position player, as we saw with Colorado um, it doesn't matter who they bring in as a quarterback. If they can't run the football, um, the, 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 the type of offense that's there isn't necessarily built for mass protect. Isn't necessarily built for, you know, bunching things up and, 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 and keeping your quarterback upright. It's built for speed and movement and things like that. So I thought it was an gr absolute great hire. Um, but I do think it has some of those subtle little hints of Sean Lewis won the argument with Deion Sanders. EC Prep says, no, I know it's not SDSU, but Bronco Mendenhall was hired. I saw that. What was crazy to me was that Rocky Long was one of the three finalists for that head coaching job at New Mexico. Um, and even more interesting is the athletic director was interviewed over the weekend and was asked about Rocky Long rumors. And he basically said, yeah, if he's interested, we will absolutely talk to him. But we also got to make sure that he's basically caught up with the times, right? <laughs> he didn't use those exact words. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> but he's like, he needs to be in a position where he's ready to embrace the 2020s version of college football with the portal and NIL and things like that. And, you know, if he, and we'll have to have a sit down and discussion about Bronco Mendenhall fits that same boat because he was a guy that kind of flamed out of Virginia because. He also didn't wasn't really a big fan of the transfer portal um, and NIL and all that stuff. But then now he ends up getting hired. So he must have answered those questions well in his interview um, with the athletic director there. But, yeah, it's going to I think there's going to be five new head coaches in the Mountain West. Uh, Craig Bull from Wyoming retired today and yeah. their defensive coordinator, or offensive coordinator got promoted to head coach. So there's that, those, that was a fifth one. Um, so it's going to be a lot of different things going on in the Mountain West next year. Yeah, you know, I think it's interesting. And we probably could close out with this. I think it's interesting. Um, it, it seems like around the Mountain West, you um, have all the teams kind of copying what San Diego State did really, really well, what Wyoming did with Coach Boyle really, really well. Bron Bronco Mendehall is going to be that old school, run the football, play good defense. Um, that's obviously what they did at Boise state this year and took them to a mountain West championship. Um, and it's interesting because San Diego state is kind of moving away from what, you know, as the trendsetter for how the mountain West has been. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see because a lot of these teams, um, you know, it, it just, it's just what it is, uh, a strong running game and defense, good special teams. It's a shortcut to being able to, to, to win. Um, and, and San Diego state, you know, they are moving away from it in terms of tempo, in terms of, you know, wanting to, to make big chunks, things of that nature. Um, but the same physical stuff is still there. Um, and so they're trying to kind of have the best of both worlds. If I ever meet you in person, I'll tell you a story about Rocky that occurred when I worked at Grossmont in the athletics department. Oh, I would love to hear Rocky stories. Oh, absolutely. We, absolutely. we didn't have the pleasure of – covering San Diego State and being credentialed media during Rocky Longs. And I've talked to other media credentialed people who were, and uh, the things I hear and how he, you know, the things he did, uh, I, w I wish we could go back in time and uh, have that, but but, but we don't. Um, by the way, I'm longtime great friends of Don DeMars. We, I mean... We I feel Don like Mars. I'm a long, I feel like I'm a long time friend of Don DeMars, even though, you know, it's only, even been, it's only been yeah. two years. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, Don, Don, Don is the, honestly, honestly, Don is the heartbeat of everything these village times does. Like Don made it great. to Grand Canyon. Yeah. To shoot photos for the basketball game last night, which was obviously it was a, it was a tough loss for the team, but uh, the atmosphere was electric and uh, Don was there snapping photos for us uh, to use for our recap articles and previews and things like that. So we should maybe talk a little hoop. We should be able to talk a little hoops. Yeah, bro. No problem. This is, this is what we do. Um, Andre and I are uh, constantly in communication, doing, doing all this kind of stuff all the time about trying to figure stuff out. Um, But you know, for for you, uh, the people who stayed up late with us, um, look out for uh, another podcast, not a live one, but one coming out on Friday. Um, Tayton Bayer, a cornerback, Centennial. Buyer. And Bayer, keep doing it. Yeah. Keep saying his <laughs> name wrong. Sorry, Tayton. You even like told us, which is terrible. Um, and uh, Will Cianfrini, um, wide receiver for um, Carlsbad. He is the, the other other guest. Um, so we're pretty stoked about getting two guys who are going to um, are committed to San Diego State, going to be going on their official visits um, this upcoming weekend. And they were nice enough to spend some time with us. And I think you're really going to enjoy, you know, it's, it's early Sundays, December 20th. I mean, it's around the corner. So uh, very, very uh, timely, timely interviews. Are you going to camp out around uh, San Diego State campus to see what kind of uh... – Places they're taking the commit the the commits or the uh, recruits to eat and stuff. You know, if if it if it just ha- so happens that uh, as I'm going to the UC Irvine game, I oh, UC oh, Irvine yeah. game. If I happen to see something, you know, but no, man, that's that's oh, there, there, there will be recruits at that game. Oh yeah, uh, oh yeah, no doubt. So I, uh, I might take a lap. I might take a lap at halftime just to. Just to sit, you know, to 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 see what's going on, but and I, um, I know where the I, I and and I will say I know where the recruits typically sit too. Okay, well, see, I'm I'm going there to cover the game, so it's it's fair game for me to be, you know, paying a little I'm bit not, of attention to that as well. I'll be we'll there, but I won't be covering the game. But um, <laughs> potential for uh, Sean Lewis to maybe get introduced and uh, say a couple words. Um, um I, I would think that that's a there's a high probability that'll happen. I agree. I agree. All right, guys. As Paul said, we definitely appreciate you guys staying up late. Um, If you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel. Please like this episode and any other episodes we have out of here. Uh, We appreciate it as always. And uh, have a good night.